We live in the age of the image. Many of us carry devices in our pockets that can shoot still photos, photos and video at high resolution out the back, or if we want to, we can take pictures of ourselves at arm's length out the front. We can reproduce these images indefinitely without a dark room, developing chemicals or paper. We can alter the images however we please without an airbrush. We can edit them every which way and transmit them across the world and around the world instantly. The surfeit of images is changing the way we live in many ways. People take pictures of their food in restaurants, and so chefs are pressed to make food that not only tastes good, but looks good. People want not only to travel, but to take pictures of themselves traveling in photogenic locations so that they can post them online. And that brings benefits, but it also causes problems to those places. We have plenty of images, but maybe not enough people who know how to look at them, who know how to really see. We are very good at taking pictures, but maybe not so good at seeing. And perhaps that ability is getting worse because the camera is doing the looking for us. Inevitably, when we set about to publicize this talk, we thought we felt we needed a suitable image, not just text. How about some Zen calligraphy? How about a painting or a sculpture of Zekai, the subject of my talk? How about a picture of a Zen temple or a scroll with a landscape on it? Actually, we wound up using a lot of those images. And in fact, on the cover of your program is a seated wooden sculpture of Zekai and also just the roof line, beautiful roof line, of one of the temples that he led. But all of all the images that I've shown you, we've given to you, this is my favorite. I first saw these paintings of cranes at Shokokuji Temple in Kyoto a number of years ago. Shokoki, Shokokuji is located in the north central district of Kyoto, right next to Doshisha University. It was founded in 1385 by the shogun Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, who ruled Japan while the emperor reigned. And he played an important role in elevating no drama from a popular entertainment to high art through his patronage of the actors Kan Ami and Ze Ami. Zekai served three terms as abbot of Shokokuji. And it is said that he brought these two paintings back from China. They are believed to have been painted by a Chinese artist during the Yuan Dynasty, and they have been designated a national treasure by, uh, sorry, important cultural property by the government of Japan. I didn't really think much of the subject matter when I saw these paintings for the first time. We all know that cranes and tortoises are regarded as auspicious in East Asia because they live a long time. And let's face it, auspiciousness is boring. It was only when I recently studied this and other items that Zekai is said to have brought back from China that I discovered how important the figure of the crane was for Zekai and how it figured in classical Chinese and by extension, classical Japanese culture. Cranes are known for their eerie cries, the whooping crane, we say, and for their enchanting dances, their long legs, give them an elegant figure, and their white feathers symbolize purity. They are not only beautiful, but they are otherworldly. Paintings like this weren't mere decoration. They represent an aspiration on the part of Zekai and others like him to be the crane, to stand apart from the world and its worldly cares, and to soar in a mystical and elegant sky. We will come back to the crane in a minute but I'd like to turn now to Zekai and his work. The monk now known to us as Zekai Chushin was born in the province of Tosa on the island of Shikoku in 1336. This was during the period of the northern and southern courts, Nambokucho, in which there were two emperors, one at Kyoto and the other, Emperor Godaigo, living in the mountains of Yoshino, each of them claiming to be the true sovereign of Japan. Each court had its own reign names, so the charts that historians use to convert Japanese era names to the Western calendar are bifurcated for the 60 or so years until the two courts were reunited in 1392. The fierce devotion of the warrior Kusunoki Masashige to Emperor Godaigo and his southern courts is portrayed memorably in the martial epic Taiheiki, or Annals of the Grand Pacification, 
and it inspired generations of Japanese people to fanatical devotion to the imperial cause. Indeed, Masashige's statue stands today in a very prominent place right outside Tokyo Station. So this is the world that Zekai, who himself belonged to a warrior family called the Tsuno, and was related to the Fujiwara as well, was born into. Despite Emperor Godaigo's brief dream of restoring direct imperial rule, this age was dominated by military forces and held together by the Ashikaga family and the Muromachi shogunate founded in 1336, the year of Zekai's birth, by Ashikaga Takauji. As a teenager, Zekai was sent up to the capital, Kyoto, to become a Zen monk. Zen Buddhism had been introduced to Japan around the year 1200, and the two great founders, Eisai and Dogen, founded the Rinzai and Soto schools, respectively. Both of these schools emphasized meditation, and Zen means simply meditation, uh, as a way for people to become enlightened, or simply to recognize that they were already enlightened and therefore liberate themselves from attachments and the painful cycle of birth, death, and rebirth called samsara, in which all of us are presently trapped. While the Soto school came to emphasize seated meditation, zazen, almost exclusively, the Rinzai practitioners also made heavy use of the koan, or spiritual dialogues between the master and disciples that were designed to nudge people or shove them toward enlightenment. And the Rinzai temples seem to have been more accepting of recognizing that enlightenment could be attained to, through doing all kinds of activities, not just seated meditation. Zekai first joined the Rinzai temple Tenyuji, which is located in the Arashiyama area west of Kyoto, and was actually founded by the Ashikaga family in memory of Emperor Godaigo. The Ashikagas had originally supported Emperor Godaigo in overthrowing the Kamakura shogunate, but eventually they turned against him and backed the northern court. Creating a great temple in his memory was a good way to placate his many supporters, as well as his spirit in the afterlife. Nearby at the Saihoji temple, there lived an old abbot called Muso Sose. Muso is known as a designer of gardens, including the famous moss garden at Saihoji, uh, also called Kokedera, and that's where Zekai met him uh, Muso was of quite advanced age, and Zekai was just a teenager. Uh, but he was much more than that. He was, at the time, an extremely famous and influential abbot, and he enjoyed the support of warriors and aristocrats alike. Muso is said to have taken an immediate liking to the young Zekai, in whom he could see a brilliant young man who would do much good. In his brief association with Muso, Zekai joined a group of monks affiliated with him, the so-called Muso faction, who controlled appointments to specific temples. Among them were Muso's nephew, the monk Shun Okumyoha, and Gido Shushin, who was from the same town as Zekai, and who would go on also to become an illustrious abbot and author. Zen monks wear a surplice, also called kesa or kasaya, over their robes. And I think if there is one object in the world that a monk is still attached to, it's his kesa. It represents his life, his existence as a monk. This kesa is said to have been used by the great monk Muso and eventually given to Zekai, who would have treasured it. Many Rinzai Zen temples were actually supported by public funds provided by the shogunate, and they were organized into a nationwide hierarchy with five temples in Kyoto and five temples in Kamakura at the top. These were the so-called gozan, or five mountains. You can see them here with the only caveat that Nanzenji was actually elevated above the Gozan. So there are six temples on the Kyoto side. Gozan Bungaku, or Five Mountains Literature, is the name given to the very substantial body of literature that the monks of these temples wrote. Most of it was in Chinese, and most of it was poetry. Zekai and Gido are known as the twin jewels of, Gido, of Gozan literature for their achievements in poetry and prose. While uh, residing at Tenmuji, Zekai was fully ordained as a monk. He was still a teenager. Later, he moved across town to the temple Kenminji in eastern Kyoto, not far from the Gion Pleasure District. He then traveled to Kamakura. He resided at temples there. As you might know, the life of a Zen monk is not an easy one. It 
It's a little bit like being in the military or even in prison. There is not a lot of time to sleep and not a lot of food, and the days are devoted to meditation, prayer, begging for alms, and work. Meals are taken communally and in silence. Despite that, or perhaps because of it, the ties between monks seem to have been quite close. They spent a tremendous amount of time together, and as monks, they were expected to remain single and celibate their entire lives. The monastery was their family. Their teacher or abbot was their father. The other monks were their older and younger brothers. At the larger monasteries, there might be hundreds of monks living in the meditation halls, sleeping on a single mat, each one of them at night, and sitting on half of that same mat during the day to meditate. While he was studying at temples in Japan, Zekai learned to read and write Chinese. As a monk, it was essential for him. The holy scriptures of Buddhism, which largely originated in India, had been transmitted to China and translated into Chinese. When Buddhism entered Japan, the sutras could be discussed and explained in Chinese, I'm sorry, in Japanese, and the Chinese characters were read with Japanese pronunciations, but the sutras themselves were not translated into Japanese and recited that way. Classical Chinese was the Latin of medieval Japan. Not only was it used for religious purposes, but most official documents were composed in classical Chinese and many people used it to write letters. Zekai, however, went a step farther. He appears to have studied some smoke, spoken Chinese while still in Japan, as there were a number of Chinese monks who had moved to Japan, and there were also some Japanese monks who had studied in China and returned with a good command of Chinese. He also learned to write verse in Chinese, which is not easy. Anyone who can count to five and seven can make a waka poem. And the Chinese poems that Zekai wrote actually did have lines of five or seven characters. But they also rhymed. They obeyed a complex tonal pattern, and they were typically parallel with regard to syntax, in addition to demonstrating an impressive knowledge of the vast body of Chinese poetry and history. And all of this had to be accomplished in what was still a foreign language. Chinese culture enjoyed tremendous prestige during this time. Those of you who love Japanese art are familiar with the term karamono, things from China, referring to art objects like the paintings of the cranes I showed you earlier. These in enjoyed great prestige among Japanese collectors and were coveted, not just for their artistry, but for their origin itself. Made in China was a term of great pride. As a Zen monk, Zekai had even more reason to go to China. He wanted to get closer to the origins of Buddhism. India was out of the question, but Zekai could join a long line of Japanese courtiers, scholars, and monks who had traveled to China and back to study. Although Zen supposedly originated in China and was trans oh, sorry, originated in India and was transmitted to China by the monk Bodhidharma, Dharma Zen, its Indian origins are not so clear, and there was a deep tradition of Zen in China going back centuries and many great temples to visit. Moreover, in his studies of Chinese language, Zekai had also studied Chinese literature and history, and he surely wanted to see the famous places that he had read about for years. Eventually, he got his wish, and he was sent to China. Zekai delayed his departure slightly so that he could be in Japan for the 33rd anniversary of his mother's death. He was 33. By this, we realize that his mother died around the time he was born, perhaps giving birth to him. Zekai never knew his mother. This is a slide of the Takase port uh, that we believe he departed from in 1368. Uh, the island of Kyushu was closest to the continent and home to traders and merchants, some of whom who were themselves Chinese. Hakata, or present-day Fukuoka, was the main port, but Zekai departed from Takase in Kumamoto Prefecture, which was an important port with the sea lines going to Okinawa. And you can see I visited this uh, port last year, and you can still see the ruins of it. He landed at Ningbo, which is not far from present-day Shanghai, and eventually made his way inland to Hangzhou, the great city of China that was centered, is centered on West Lake. The year was 1368. The Yuan Dynasty, during uh, which the uh, Mongols ruled China under hegemons like Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan, and even attempted to 
uh, invade China twice had just ended. The Yuan dynasty had been overthrown by a Chinese peasant uh, who had just managed to raise his own army and he established the Ming dynasty where you see Emperor Hanyu. Zekai was treated very well at the temples of Hangzhou. He studied mainly at the Zhong Tianzhu temple which is located west of West Lake. Some pictures I took last week. We don't have a lot of information about what he did uh, in China outside of the poems he wrote, so we have to turn to them to find out what he was up to. Let's go back to our cranes. This is the grave of the poet Lin Bu uh, on uh, an island in the middle of West Lake called Lone Peak or Bushan. And long ago in the northern Song Dynasty, uh, he was a poet and a hermit there who lived from 967 to 1028. Lin Bu was inordinately fond of two things, plum blossoms and cranes. In fact, it was said of him that the plum blossom was his wife and the cranes were his children. The story further goes that Lin Bu hated to receive visitors. And so when someone came to call, he would get into his boat and row out onto the lake. And he would have his servant send the caller away. When the visitor left, the servant was to release Lin Bu's precious cranes to fly over the lake and to let the master know that it was safe to come home. And you see here the a crane releasing pavilion uh, that has been celebrated there for really centuries. Well, Zekai went to the site of Limbu's old hermitage. It's actually right there, right next to his, his grave. And he wrote this poem, uh, calling the poet by his pen name, Ze Jing. The snow has cleared but the cranes have not returned to Lone Peak. At his abandoned former dwelling, a few boughs of plum. The master's lofty style can no longer be viewed, but perhaps it is enough to have seen the plum blossoms. Zekai had probably read Limbu's poetry since he was a well-known poet and he knew his story. He took time from his clerical duties to visit this place and to reflect on the passage of time. The cranes were gone and they haven't come back. I was there and I asked but the plum blossoms were still there, and of course the master was long gone too. We do find some solace, however, in the durability of nature. And this is not the only appearance of cranes in Zekai's poetry. They appear several times, and always in a positive sense. Before he left China, Zekai visited his former teacher and went to him and wrote a poem in which he remarked on how his teacher looked like a crane meaning not just that his hair had turned white or whiter than it had been, but that his appearance had taken on greater dignity and grace. In their world, this was a great compliment. Zekai wrote many other fine poems while he was in China, among them what is probably his masterpiece called Early Departure, in which the speaker sets out very early one morning in the winter on a journey by foot. But I'd like to transition to our broader theme of diplomacy by discussing a poem that he wrote in Nanjing, the capital, in 1376. One of Zekai's Chinese teachers had been appointed abbot of a prestigious temple in Nanjing, so it was probably he who arranged for Zekai to be given an audience with the first Ming emperor, which was, of course, a great honor. The emperor showed Zekai into a side room, and he asked him to point out Japan on the map. He did so, and then the emperor asked him in particular about the Kumano region in Wakayama Prefecture today. It's a deeply, deeply wooded area. It's a holy site. It's the site of the three famous Kumano shrines, the main shrine, the new shrine, and the Nachi shrine, which with its famous waterfall. According to an ancient Chinese story, the first Qin emperor sent the sorcerer Shufu to find the elixir of eternal life. And Shufu loaded up several large ships with people and supplies, and he headed east, but he never came back. Some of the legends later said that Shufu had landed in Japan, and it was actually at Kumano that he landed and perhaps found this elixir. So the emperor on the spot said to Zekai, I'd like you to compose a poem. Here it is. Before the peaks of Kumano, there is a shrine to Shufu. The medicinal herbs that fill the mountains are lush with so much rain. Right now, the waves on the ocean are calm, and there are fair winds for 10,000 leagues. 
surely he will return soon. And then the emperor used the rhyming characters of Zekai's poems at the ends of the first, second, and fourth line to compose a reply as a gesture of respect and friendship. And here is his reply. The peaks of Kumano are lofty, animals are sacrificed at the shrine. There must be ample amounts of amber in the roots of the pine trees. Years ago, Shufu sought the elixir of the wizards, but even now, he has still not returned. Before Zekai left the emperor, he was given various gifts, including, we believe, this surplice. In fact, this might be the surplice that Zekai is wearing in the portrait. Hard to say. In 1377, Zekai returned to Japan by ship. He landed at Hakozaki in Fukuoka, where he recovered from his travels. The following year, he made his way to Kyoto. In retrospect, this was the beginning of his ascent up the hierarchy of Japanese Zen. As I mentioned earlier, there were five temples each in Kyoto and Kamakura that were designated the highest rank. Above all of these temples, however, was the Shogun, who designated one monk as Soroku to administer the temple affairs, such as appointments of abbots, establishment of new temples, and so forth. Zekai was eventually appointed to this post in 1389 and thus became the highest ranking Zen monk in the country, but his ascent was not smooth. On more than one occasion, as you see here, Zekai appears to have had a falling out with Yoshimitsu. We're not quite sure of the precise reasons, but it seems that Zekai was prone to expressing his views frankly, as the phrase goes. He would withdraw to a temple in the country and be received with great hospitality by one of the local generals. On one occasion, Yoshimitsu wrote to him, urging him to come back, and Zekai replied he could not, he was ill. Then Yoshimitsu wrote to the general, ordering him to send Zekai back, and Zekai was back on his way to Kyoto that night. During this period, we see, as you can imagine, in Zekai's poetry, a strong desire to withdraw from the world. I think we tend to think that monks and nuns have no problems because they are not part of the market economy and they don't have to provide for their children or for their parents. But that does not appear to be the case. Like academia, monastic life has its own set of problems. And with all of Zekai's responsibilities, he must have found it quite a burden. He himself longed for a simple life in the mountains, living close to nature and away from people. Eventually, Zekai and Yoshimitsu settled their differences. In 1395, Yoshimitsu decided to retire, to take holy orders, and become a Buddhist lay monk. His head was shaved by Zekai. At the time, Zekai uh, explained the process of enlightenment to Yoshimitsu using a set of 10 pictures that he gave him, probably as a gift commemorating the shogun's ordination. And these uh, pictures are quite famous. They're called the 10 ox herding pictures, or the Jujuzu. And they explain the process of enlightenment using the metaphor of a boy who is in charge of an ox, but he loses track of it and has to go find it. This is the first one. It's called searching for the ox. And these pictures are attributed to the artist Shubun who later became the teacher of the famous painter Seshu, and they get most of the attention. I think they're also designated important cultural properties. It's not so well known, but each picture is accompanied by an explanation. Uh, Zekai inscribed these traditional explanations for each one, and he added a poem of his own composing uh, to them as well. And I love the explanation for this one. Why do you need to go looking for something you never lost? referring to this idea that we haven't truly lost our enlightenment, we just misplaced it, we don't know where it is, and we can find it. We have spent uh, a little bit of time uh, looking at the religious, political, linguistic context in which Zekai lived. I'd like to turn now to diplomacy and trade. The Chinese approach to foreign relations was very simple. China was below heaven, but above the rest of the earth hence the term the Middle Kingdom or the Middle Flower. And that meant that it could not have equal relations with other countries, but the other countries would have to engage in a tributary relationship. This is how they conducted with their, their relations with what we can call for convenience Korea and Vietnam. 
Japan, however, was a different story. Japan could not be invaded by land, and even the Mongols had failed to invade it with their massive fleets. The Japanese, too, believed that their emperor was the son of heaven and regarded as an insult any invitation to join in a vassal-like relationship with the Chinese emperor, even if China was older, larger, and more developed at the time than Japan was. The Chinese, however, had leverage in the form of trade. The trade in goods between Japan and China could be extremely lucrative. You could load up a ship in Japan with good goods like swords, folding fans, gold, other raw materials, take them to China, and you could bring back goods worth 10 times what you delivered. Books, paintings, ceramics, luxury items. You could even just sell your goods for cash, because at this time, the Japanese did not mint their own coins. They just imported Chinese coins, and they used those. It caused inflation at various points in Chinese economic history, because the Japanese were taking so much of their copper cash in Japan. And in fact, many entities, not just merchants, but warlords and temples, revealed, uh, uh, reaped the profits of the maritime trade. Of course, trade comes with risks. You can get cheated. Your cargo can get ruined. Or your entire ship can get lost. You could have regulatory problems with the other government. And your ship might be turned away on arrival. All of these things happen. And even if you successfully made your trade and enjoyed calm seas on the return, you still had to worry about pirates. There were groups of pirates called Wako who plied the seas between China, Korea, and Japan, attacking ships and stealing their cargo. The name suggests that they were Japanese, but recent research suggests that they were multinational and multilingual groups. Some were based in Korea, which makes sense as these groups also raided the western coast of Korea, and some of them got quite far inland. In fact, there are places where they attacked inland in China as well. And so the Chinese wished to engage Japan as a junior partner, but the Japanese were unwilling. On the other hand, the Japanese wanted permission from the Chinese to land and to trade. The Chinese and the Koreans as well wanted the Japanese to do their part to stop the Wako pirates who were operating out of their waters. But how could they accomplish this? The imperial court would not receive their envoys and for that matter, could not stop the pirates, ever. Enter the shogun, Yoshimitsu, prince of Japan. He could stop the pirates, and he would be delighted to call himself a vassal of the Chinese emperor and accept this title, Nippon Koku, the prince of Japan. That is exactly what happened between 1401 and 1402, 1403, through an exchange of letters. Later generations would criticize Yoshimitsu for his obsequiousness toward the Chinese emperor. Not only did Yoshimitsu accept the title and send tribute, but when he received a letter from the Chinese emperor, he would first burn incense and bow his head to the ground before opening it. Zekai played an important role in these negotiations, which were not guaranteed to succeed. Various figures on the Japanese side had sought the title of Prince of Japan, but had been refused. First of all, Zekai is said to have composed the letters, which were, of course, written in classical Chinese, the lingua franca, or lingua sinica, of East Asia. The Koreans also con conducted their correspondence with China in Chinese. And second, Zekai himself received the Chinese envoys in his quarters at Shokokuji, very close to Yoshimitsu's palace in Kyoto, when they delivered their letters. And here we have another remarkable exchange of poems. Welcoming the envoys to his quarters, Zekai brought out the scroll with the poem that the first Ming emperor, who had by, by that time passed away, had ordered him to write. And he brought out the poem that the emperor had written to them. And he asked the envoys to write their own matching verses. And they did it. This is by the uh, Chinese envoy Dao Yi, the man of the Qin who had gathered the medicine long ago had a shrine. How many times has the spring breeze seen the buds of the medicinal plants mature? In the past, the old Zen monk reached China. The imperial brush composed a verse and bestowed it on him for his long journey home. And you'll notice that the, the ends, the last characters in the first, second, and the fourth line match 
the characters that were used by Zekai and the Emperor in their exchange of poems in the main palace that had taken place 30, 35 years earlier. The other envoy was actually a monk, Yudu, and this is what he wrote. He hung him his pilgrim's staff at Dragon River, this is the famous temple in Nanjing, the old Buddhist temple. For his whole life he has been lofty and pure, eschewing the light and the fat. He was summoned to the palace of the golden imperial carriage and composed a poem. Having received a heavenly fragrance, he returned home with it, filling his sleeves. And again, he uses the same rhymes that were used before, but the context is changing. They're not writing about Kumano anymore. They're writing about Zekai and his trip to China. As we can see from this exchange, Buddhist monks played an important role in international diplomacy at the time. They were, after all, members of their own transnational, translingual organization. And they used poems composed in classical Chinese to connect with one another and maintain good relations. These exchanges are remarkable, but not atypical. There are many others like them, containing poems written by Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese diplomats. The envoys brought on behalf of the emperor many gifts which they gave the shogun, including this magnificent Buddhist surplus. Uh, I recently read a book about uh, an exhibition catalog about Buddhist surpluses, and this was by far the most impressive example. It was surely uh, woven at the Ming court, and the care and the expense that was expended on this surplus, which has 25 panels, is really extraordinary. This was presented to the shogun, uh, and at some point it was given to Zekai and preserved by him. Okay, this is the end of the talk. Here it is. A few thoughts. Japanese literature, as I said in the abstract, is not always written in Japanese. What is Japanese literature? Is it what Japanese people write? Is it in Japanese? Is the Book of Tea, which was written by Okakura Tenshin in English in 1906, Japanese literature? How about the many haiku and tanka that have been written by many Japanese uh, people living in Seattle up to the present day? Many non-Japanese people, including myself, sometimes write literary works in Japanese. Are they Japanese literature? I would say yes to all of these questions. And the poetry that Zekai and other monks wrote is Japanese literature too, even though it was written in Chinese. And it may also be, at the same time, Chinese literature. The Seattle Asian Art Museum recently reopened with galleries organized not according to national categories, but by artistic groupings. And I have to say, as an aficionado of calligraphy, I'm very glad to have it all in one room so I can look at it and just soak it up. Maybe we should be moving in the same direction with regard to literature. I would add my department is called Asian Languages and Literature, which subtly reflects the view that someone at some time had this thought that there is such a thing as Asian literature in the singular. Second, who were these people? The Wako were said to be Japanese, and some certainly were, but it turns out that they were more than that. Yoshimitsu was the shogun of Japan, but he was also a vassal of the Chinese emperor. Zekai was Japanese, but he wrote in Chinese, and he loved Jap Chinese civilization. In his poems, he's writing within that tradition. And as a Zen Buddhist, he was part of a religion that crossed national boundaries and was practiced in China, Korea, Japan, and elsewhere. These people were Japanese, but they were also, if not Asian yet, East Asian. We find ourselves now in the midst of a viral epidemic that originated in China, soon crossed to Japan and Korea and other parts of Asia, and has now arrived in Seattle. One glimmer of hope we have in all of this gloom is the way in which this epidemic has the potential to unite us. We are all in the same boat, as it were, and we have to cooperate. I read recently of aid packages that were sent from Japan to Hubei province in China. And you'll see at the very bottom, there is a line of Chinese verse inscribed on it. The poem says, though mountains and rivers differ by country, the wind and the moon are the same under heaven. This poem is 1,300 years old, or this couplet. It is said to have been written by Prince Nagaya of Japan to the Chinese uh, monk Jian Jian, Jian Zhen, 
or Ganjin about 1,300 years ago, asking Ganjin to come to Japan and to teach the Buddhist way. After receiving this letter with this poem, Ganjin decided to make the journey. It took him six attempts. During that time, he lost his eyesight, but he finally arrived in 754, 25 years after the death of Prince Naga. This uh, poem uh, inscribed on the aid packages, not just the aid package itself, but the sentiment, I understand, was deeply appreciated in China. It's true that we have our differences. For better or worse, issues that cross borders require our attention, not only public health, but also the protection of the environment. For possible answers to our present and future problems, we might do well to study 